Okay, let's uh, let's pray and then we'll start. Yeah, let's pray. Father, we we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for bringing us to the um, Lord, almost to the end of this week, and uh, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, Lord. That has been so true and Lord, so unwavering. Oh, Father God, we just want to thank you and bless your name. And even at this time, Lord, we we just want to, um, Lord, uh, give you praise for all that you are, Lord, <clears throat> the way you've been leading us, Father God. And uh, Master, we thank you that uh, you're our teacher, that um, you're the one who guides us into all truth. And so this morning, we, we, we just yield ourselves, Lord, to your teaching, to your guidance. And uh, Lord, we ask that you would... Um, you would speak to us as only you can through your scriptures, Lord, through your word, Father God. And uh, Spirit of God, we ask that you would quicken your word to our hearts today. We thank you. We give you all the praise and all the glory at this time. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> okay, just a minute. Right. Okay. So we've been studying Corinthians. We looked at um, um, chapter five, right? I think we finished with chapter five last uh, in, in last class. So um, chapter five, Paul addressing a very very uh, a serious issue, right? Uh, one that is of uh, um, he. Uh, talking about uh, you know the seriousness of sin in a person's life, and uh, he um, the several things uh, come through in that chapter: the seriousness of sin in a believer's life, continued sin in a believer's life, and the response to that by a church or the body of believers. Then we also see the kind of authority that God had given. Paul, and uh, that we have as believers, you know, um, as uh, leaders, and the authority is for edification, to build up people, not to destroy people's lives, right? And also, the, we see, we, we saw that um, the kind of, uh, with the kind of authority that Paul, uh, hands, you know, or that's what, you know, uh, that is how it's recorded, right, is handing over that person who was continuing in a rebellious sin um, to Satan, right? That's what uh, it says, handing over to Satan uh, so that his flesh may be destroyed, but his spirit is, um, that he, his spirit might be saved. Um, so that is what we um, see. And he, uh, it's, uh, it's quite a serious thing, and we see uh, we see references to that. And one other place also, he does the same thing, right? With uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander, two other people, with whom uh, you know he does the same thing. So then we we studied in order to understand what is it, what does it mean to you know um, to do that, right? What does it mean to um, hand over, deliver such a one? That is in verse five is what we saw. Right? 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, uh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of <clears throat> uh, day of the Lord Jesus. And he goes on to actually explain what what was it. What was it? Uh, in in what way did he carry it out? He said, in the, um, in, in the person being put out of fellowship of that local body of believers. That is, put out of fellowship. Um, from the from the church, right? So, so that was a serious thing. Um, so we we also consider the fact that uh, you know he is continuing to live in sin, um, unrepentant, right? Uh, not taking any course of action, not correcting oneself, despite repeated um, uh, pointing out. Okay, despite repeated requests to change one's life, right? So uh, the person continuing. So only in that case, it's an extreme case, right? Where, but this has to be done, 
because Paul says that it just takes a little east, a little leaven to, um, in order to, uh, you know, in order to influence the entire um, uh, lump. Okay, so this is what he says, right? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Verse six, meaning that it just takes a little bit of ease to influence the the rest of the dough. So he says, you know, purge out the old leaven. And and the reference that he makes was uh, that he makes is the the feast of the past, uh, feast of the unleavened bread. And uh, when the Israelites would actually clean out the entire house of anything to do with leaven, anything to do with yeast. Right, uh, that thing would actually make the dough rise. They would clean out the entire household, and uh, that represented the leaven, uh, represented Egypt and uh, whatever things that they were held by, and uh, whatever things they they were, uh, you know, uh, they were actually delivered from. Right. So, uh, so Paul uh, mentions that also in chapter five. Okay, so. Now, now the the uh, we also saw that the reason for him to do that is that the person will repent. Okay, the person would understand the seriousness of the kind of life that person was living, and would hopefully repent and not also influence the um, the believers to do the wrong thing. Okay, so several things because of which this particular action, this particular de decision, had to be taken. Okay. So let's look at chapter 6. Chapter 6 um, is talking about a few other things okay, um, um, and laying down certain instructions for the believers. Okay, So let's uh, look at chapter 6. Um, uh, I'll just read a few verses and then we'll explain this. Right? Um, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you not unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to brother, brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? Okay, so that's that's how uh, those are the first eight verses. Okay, so what what is he addressing here? Okay, what what is he talking about? What is he addressing? Okay, the issue here is that the believers were actually going to court. That is the civil court of those days, and they were having issues with each other or, diff or um, uh, you know problems with each other, and they were actually filing uh, court cases against each other. Okay, now now this was uh, in those days. We need to understand that uh, you know in Corinth, typically there was a race platform called. Uh, Bema, Bema seat, uh, the Bema, the seat of judgment. Okay, it was called Bema, and uh, it, it was which meant judgment seat. And in that race platform, the judge would sit. And on other two platforms, the the one who's bringing the uh, you know uh, the one who's bringing the complaint, the one who's accusing, and the one who is being accused, right? The accused and the accuser both will sit on other. Uh, you know, other places. So this race platform called the judgment seat or the bema, um, the 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 judge would sit and issue judgment. Okay, he would hear okay what was being said, all the arguments, and then issue a judgment. Now, to watch this, people would gather. Okay, so 
the the others you know it it'll be made up of people who are from all walks of life so they would come they would watch and so paul is saying you know what kind of testimony are you leaving are you leaving behind what kind of testimony are you giving to the world when a brother is filing a court case against another brother okay and the whole world is watching you know you're calling yourself a believer you're calling yourself a christian a follower of christ and you are filing these court cases against each other and the whole world is watching so he's saying you know don't you is there not any one who can actually you know settle this matter you can settle this matter peacefully among yourselves is there not even one you know and then he talks about how um, you know as believers we are called to judge angels you know we will be actually ruling over cities you know this is the position of the believer you know uh, we are co heirs joint heirs with christ we are uh, we are uh, you know god has set us uh, to as examples to angels you know angels desire to look into and learn the things um that uh, that has been revealed to us and so uh, god's plan is also that we in his rule millennial rule that we will actually be ruling over cities and and bringing uh, judgment and so on but you know but are you not able to solve this are you not able to settle this between yourselves okay so um, so this is what um, uh, he's he says um so the, the problem was that um, in the corinthian church that people were uh filing court cases against one another right they they were unnecessarily doing that and uh, not really uh, talking sitting down talking settling the matter between themselves so paul is encouraging them you know you need to actually settle it between yourselves and not drag everything to civil court now the question is you know was paul against uh the justice system was paul against the civil court um uh no right so paul is just uh, referring to the fact that or or emphasizing that you don't need to go to court you can actually settle it between yourselves you can actually talk and settle it between yourselves and you know in the court you have a person who's not a believer who is uh, going to be a judge you know in most cases and he is going to be he is going to be settling the matters between you two whereas you as believers you have the wisdom of god you have um, you have a sense of what is right and what is wrong so why can't you settle it between yourselves okay so that is the, that is the thing he's saying you know um, is is there not even a wise man among you verse 5 right so but how is it that the brother goes to court against an other brother and that before unbelievers now people are watching and people are talking and then they're saying you know oh these believers this uh, christians you know they are uh, here's this is the thing this person is you know uh, putting a court case against this person and they they're doing so they are actually talking ill about the church about believers themselves so he's saying you know um verse 7 is saying it's an utter failure that that you do you're doing this it is an utter failure for you that you go to go to law against one another you see the second part of that verse okay second part of the verse he's saying you know why do you not rather accept wrong why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated okay so it's it's a it's a very challenging thing and he's telling the believers you know okay this brother has wronged you why don't you rather accept that okay and why don't you let yourself be cheated rather than do this look at verse 8 no you yourselves do wrong and cheat and you do these things to your brethren so which means that see this so this was a problem it was not a question of um you know getting justice but they were actually cheating one another right they were doing wrong to one another they were cheating one another maybe it was something to do with land maybe it was something to do with business we don't know we, we don't know the details of it but the fact is that they were 
cheating one another. Here are these group of believers who are born again, who are gathering together in church, and they are, you know, filing court cases in order to cheat one another, in order to do wrong to one another. And Paul is coming against that. He's saying he's not, you know, talking ill about the justice system. You know, Paul himself actually appealed, uh, you know, uh, uh, Twice, I think, once when you know um, when he was in, uh, when he was uh, arrested and put in prison in Philippi, and he appealed to the Roman court. He said, "You know, I'm a Roman citizen. How can you, you know, how can you put me in prison?" Um, so he appealed. You know, if you remember, he he appealed. You know, that time. So he is not against the justice system of the land. He is not against the courts and and so on. But he is against this, that the believer would do something wrong to another believer, that the believer would cheat another believer and go to court in order to do that, right? Okay, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So he's saying, no, do you not know that the unrighteous will not? You know, if you're continuing in an unrighteous lifestyle or continuing consistently doing unrighteous things. Right? So he's saying, they don't you know that such a person or such people will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he's saying, you know, and he's listing down a few people. He's listing down, you know, thieves and adulterers and idolaters and sodomites and homosexuals and so on. And he's saying, you know, those who are continuing like this, you know, having this as a lifestyle, are continuing to do these things, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. So don't you know that? And then in verse 11, you know, he's saying, and such were some of you. Okay, such were some of you. You were like this, but you were washed, uh, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So he's saying, you know, he's giving this big list and he's saying, you know, such were some of you. So he's looking at the church and saying, you know, this list that I've read out about thieves and adulterers and idolaters. Some of you were like this. Some of you were having this kind of a lifestyle. This kind of a life is what you led. But you were washed. You were cleansed. But you were sanctified. What does sanctified mean? To be set apart. Right? You were set apart from, from the world and set apart for holy use by God. You were set apart from that, all unrighteousness. But you were justified, you know, made right with God, right relationship with God. You were justified. It's it's a one-time thing. So so we see that you know you were washed, that is cleansed, you were sanctified, set apart by God. And you were justified, okay, made right, brought into that right relationship with God. Even though you were like that, you know, such was your lifestyle, that extreme kind of a lifestyle, living in sin, but you were washed. Okay, so he's saying, why do you want to continue to live like that? You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So that's the thing. Uh, the the important thing is that it's you are sanctified, you are justified by the uh, Lord Jesus, by the name in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Okay. So so when when we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and in the by the authority and the power of His name. This was ha this happened to you, you know. You were set apart and you were made right, and so on. So now, what is he saying? You know, as believers, you are washed. As believers, you are sanctified, and as believers, you are justified in the name of the Lord. Okay, right. So then he goes on to 
talk about something else. So the so the first part of this chapter is talking about uh, court cases and uh, you know against cheating and against uh, doing people a fellow believer wrong um, uh, by dragging them to court uh, in order to cheat them and so on. So he says, you you cannot do that. You cannot do that. Rather, you sit and resolve it out of court, right? And also, he's, he's, he's not against the justice system. We need to understand that. You know, sometimes we can apply this in a wrong way, saying, okay, as Christians, I should not go to court. I should not go in for justice. I should not ask for justice. No, he's not against that. But he's against doing people wrong, cheating people by dragging them to court or cheating a fellow believer by dragging that person to court. Okay. Okay. Now let's look at uh, the second part of the chapter. Uh, the second part, uh, verse 12 onwards, is saying, you know, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised uh, God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two shall, to who he says shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, but you were for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay. So several important things here. After finishing and after talking about the fact that uh, you know you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified. Um, now he, he goes on to say, you know, uh, now these things are lawful. There are several things are lawful, um, you know, accepted, uh, which are considered right, but there, these are not beneficial for me. Okay. So in this context, what is he talking about? He's, he's actually talking, addressing sexual immorality, right? So he says, flee sexual immorality. So, so he's saying, you know, um, in the culture, what is what what he actually means is this: that um, you know, in a culture, in a certain culture, there could be uh, things that we do as tradition, as culture, that could be accepted by people, accepted by all. Okay, uh, like there's not people might say, okay, socially, you know, it's it's accepted, or you know, this is how tradition. It's just a tradition. But he's saying that these things are not beneficial for me, right? For example, um, you know, we, we know this was blatant sin because um, in Corinth. They were actually uh, very loose morals, people with very loose morals. And culturally, it was accepted to go to that temple of, uh, you know, Aphrodite and uh, and also uh, make use of the services of a harlot or a harlot or a prostitute, right? As an act of worship even, right? So it was accepted. It was considered a religious thing. It was okay for people to do that but now paul is addressing that he's saying you know i know <laughs> that uh, it is it is okay culturally in your culture but i will not be brought under the power of any 
food for the stomach stomach for the food but god will destroy both it and them now the body is not for sexual immorality but for the lord and the lord for the body so he's saying very clear the body is not for sexual immorality you know you might think that okay it's acceptable you might think that oh, you know this is the culture um, this is what uh, is being followed here but he's saying that body is not very clearly it is uh, you know body is not for sexual immorality because god will it and them okay um and also it you know it answers uh, another issue like you know maybe there are certain other things to have you know uh, this is not in context but i'm just saying you know maybe there are certain things that are accepted by culture accepted by tradition but the fact is when you look at it that uh, you know you you think about it you know even food even good food and all that do you want to be controlled by it right do you want to be controlled by it because uh, he's saying you know i will not be brought under the power of any even things that are lawful okay even things that are you know lawful there are i will not be brought under the power of that okay? even things that are lawful they are not helpful okay now people might say okay this is this is okay it's permissible you know in in a culture they might say okay drinking is okay drinking is fine um but is it helpful right it it could be lawful we're not going against the law of the land uh, they might say you know they the law might be very very different the law might be saying ah, it is it is okay to do this it is okay to do that uh it's you're not going against the law you're not breaking a law but is it helpful okay, there's a higher law which paul is referring to you know he is uh, appealing to you know a law that is above the law of the land even he's saying you know but all things are not helpful all thing uh, i will not be brought under the power of any you know uh, and uh, especially when it come to food food for the stomach and appetites of the body i will not be brought under the power right? even things that are permissible even things that are considered not lawful i will not be brought under the power of any okay verse 14 and god both raised up the lord and will also raise us up by his power is is referring to the you know the resurrection power of the lord is referring to that and he's saying you know this is what i was raised up by um uh, i was uh, yeah, resurrection of christ actually raised me up and is that work in my body okay so uh, verse yeah verse 14 um after he says after saying that the body is not for sexual immorality you know it's not for sexual immorality it's not for anything like that but god raised me up okay he raised me up and uh, the resurrection power of the lord is at work in my body so therefore um you know i, I my body is consecrated okay he is the head he is um the healer he is my strengthener right so my body my physical body is not for any kind of immoral activity or it's not for sexual sin okay then he goes on to talk about something you know something that is of uh, significance verse 15 do you not know that your bodies are members of christ you know he's saying so you know in, see in culture in in corinthian culture it's all permissible people are living like this and you're saying you know why why should i not why should i also not live like this you know um why why should i be any different right it is it is okay for this culture to live like that it is okay to maybe you know uh, live together before marriage it's okay to you know have multiple uh partners um, and it, it's not considered a taboo it's not considered shame, shameful in society you know this is how it is but he's saying uh, do you not know that your bodies are members of christ now consider this that your body you know the parts of your body they are members of the spiritual body of christ 
like they are members of the body of Christ, members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Okay, so, uh, you know, just think about it. As holy as Christ is, as sinless as Christ is, uh, and I have become a member of Christ, my body has become a member of Christ. Shall I then take the member of Christ and make it part of the body of a prostitute or uh, you know, use the the old word, English word is harlot. Shall I do that? Saying, certainly not. I cannot do that. You know, it is it is not it is not right. I cannot do that. And verse sixteen. Do you not know that he who is joined to uh, or he who has a sexual relationship um, with another person, you know, is one flesh with that person? Right? That is what uh, you know. We see in uh, Genesis where the Lord says, "You know, the man for this reason a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife." You know, he's talking about the sexual relationship, and he's saying, um, "So, uh, you know, they will become one flesh." So, don't you know the reality of that? So, how can you uh, have a sexual relationship with a prostitute, knowing fully well that this is the reality right it's going to affect you verse 18 flee sexual immorality i'm oh, sorry verse 17 he says he who is joined to the lord is one spirit with him now now what has happened is when you came to the lord you know he, when you came to be in christ you are one spirit with him right you are your spirit is one with his spirit um apart from the fact that Christ indwells you, apart from the fact that Holy Spirit indwells you, you are actually one spirit with Him. Okay, so you have this higher reality, you're living in a higher reality, you're living in a, you know, you have a law that is um, above these laws, you have a standard that is above these laws, sorry, right? You have values that are above the natural law of the land. So um, you are part of Christ's body. And you are one spirit with with him, with the Lord. So you have all these things which are yours. Therefore, flee sexual immorality. You know, run away. Flee sexual immor immorality. Um, right. Uh, so, uh, verse eighteen. Right. Every sin that a man does. Okay. Every sin that a person, a man does, is outside his body in the sense. Um, you know, any other kind of sin is outside his body. But the this, this sin of sexual nature is, is actually against his own body. Right? Uh, is against his own body. So he's saying, you know, flee, run away from sexual immorality just run away from this you know treat it as something serious enough to run away from you know uh, so the thing is um, uh, uh, the seriousness of it is presenting them with the seriousness of this kind of sin you know, he's saying flee sexual immorality run away from it um, just it's as if you're running away to seek safety Right, let's say you're running away from danger. You know, that kind of an attitude you have towards sexual sin. Okay, um, so you're saying you know, that's how serious it is. Therefore, uh, you run away from. You know, if there is a temptation, um, you know, don't even, you know, think about it. Don't don't argue. Don't discuss. Just run away. Remove away from it. Right, so so that's a, that's an important lesson for us, all of us, right? So, for us not to put ourselves in a place of such a place of temptation, you know, and and um, yes, uh, today, you know, when when we, when we consider media, you know, internet, uh, and how things are easily available on the phone, on the laptop, you know, so for us. Again, the seriousness of this message, where he's saying, flee sexual immorality. 
okay um don't even consider it don't think about it don't argue with it saying that you are stronger you'll be able to overcome temptation no you know you say, don't don't fool yourself like that okay the best thing is to have this mindset that i'm going to i'm going to run away from this okay so don't get caught in this kind of a sin run away from it okay then um verse 19 do you not know that your body is the temple of the holy spirit okay so so here specifically he's saying you know your body is the temple you know he says uh, your members of christ okay then he you goes on to say that um, how can you make a member of christ a member of uh, a harlot you are one spirit with the lord that's the second thing he says and and the third one you know in the in the in the same chapter he's reiterating a position reiterating the level of holiness that we can actually live with he's saying you know don't you know that the your body is the temple of the holy spirit your body is the temple of the holy spirit meaning that the spirit of god dwells in you okay uh he you, your body is the is a dwelling place the temple of the holy spirit so you know we we uh he uses this you uh, this phrase temple earlier also right we saw in chapter 3 okay that don't you know that you are the temple of god so there he is referring to them collectively as a church collectively as a group you are the temple of god so whoever defiles this temple god will destroy now if you remember uh, chapter 3 and which verse was it verse 16 right do you not know that you are the temple of god and the spirit of god dwells in you so he's talking to them collectively as a people here he's saying individually okay don't you know that your body is the temple of the holy spirit okay your body is the temple of the holy spirit which means that you you are a dwelling place of the holy spirit and so therefore um uh, so uh, yeah verse 19 whom you have from god and you are not your own okay so that's the conclusion the fact is that you have been you and i we have been bought with a price Okay, verse twenty. You were bought at a price. The a great price was paid in order to buy us out of slavery. In order to buy us. In order to redeem us. Christ redeemed us, right? And with His own precious blood, He redeemed us. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God. Okay, you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God. Not just with your words. Not just with your songs. but he's saying you know glorify god in your body and in your spirit which actually belong to him right so you've been bought meaning you you have been purchased okay so you just think about it when when somebody suppose you go and buy something that article maybe it, maybe you bought a phone from a shop or maybe you bought uh, you know you some clothes some shirt for yourself or some trouser that belongs to you okay that belongs to you it belongs to you all the time completely okay so suppose uh, you bought a shirt that shirt everything buttons pocket collar right everything belongs to you 100% all the time because you paid the price and bought so paul is referring to that he's saying you know the you were bought at a price so which means that all of you you know your entire being you actually belong to jesus you belong to jesus you belong to him you were bought at a price um so you belong to him therefore glorify god in your body and in your spirit you are a purchased possession the spirit of god dwells in you so glorify god okay um flee sexual immorality don't dabble in sexual sin and um, he, and he also says uh, verse 18 you know he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body 
right? Against his own body, he's committing damage to his own body, um, and so on, right? So, um, so the word sexual immorality, you know, refers to everything that God had not ordained, right? It could be sex out, outside of marriage, sex before marriage, um, you know, uh, adultery, and any kind of sexual perversion that is not designed by God, saying, you know, don't indulge in it, right? Um, flee from it, okay? So, um, so he's, in chapter 6, he's addressing two main things, okay, two main topics. One is about court cases, and the other one is about fleeing sexual immorality. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, chapter seven before we take a break. Okay, any questions here? Maybe about court cases, maybe about you know anything else that we read so far. Any questions? Anything that you want to add? You can do that. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, so um, Aaron is asking, what about court marriage? Okay, so is it okay for people to get married in court? Okay, uh, now, um, yeah, so, so for so court marriage, um, wh what happens is uh, in the court, you register the marriage, right? See, now, uh, even in our... Um, like for a person who gets married in ch in church, right? Then the registration happens. Uh, it, we, uh, every person, every couple which uh, which gets married in church needs to get their uh, marriage registered in the court. That's the rule. That's the law of the land. Like you have to have your marriage registered. So for that, you have to either go to the office of the marriage registrar or the marriage registrar himself will come for you know come to the wedding ceremony and get that done okay so that's the that's uh, that that's how it's done so it's the process of registration so um, you know in some cases what happens is the marriage registrar is there for the wedding ceremony and then you know it's all done in one uh, one shot the other thing is that um the marriage uh, you know ceremony is over and then you go and get it registered because that's mandatory. So that's how it's done. But I think you, you, what your question is, you know, let's say uh, church is not involved at all, okay? And uh, can we uh, get the uh, marriage registered in the uh, in the uh, uh, you know office uh, registered office? Um, the question is again, you know, why and uh, now why I, why is somebody considering that? Okay, so there could be many reasons. One could be that uh, you know the maybe one person is a believer, a believer family, and so on. The other person, maybe only the that person, maybe let's say the girl or the guy is a believer, but the family is not. Okay, the family is coming from a maybe a different background altogether, religious background. So they are opposed to the whole wedding happening in a church. You know, they're saying you know we don't want anything to do with church. We don't want. We are okay. To both of you getting married, but we don't want you know the people are there, our relatives are there, are the thing, and they will not like it if you do it in a church. So um, you know, so we will go in for a registered thing. Well, it's fine, you know, uh, it it is okay, and maybe the couple can have a time of prayer in front of the church. Maybe later, yeah, you know. Uh, Sunday service or a separate service after that, or a time of uh, uh, you know uh, exchanging vows even after that. That is fine. That is, that is okay. So, so these are the reasons for which you know the court marriage happens, uh, and uh, which which is okay. You know, no considering the fact that you need to actually get it. Uh, it's a mandatory thing to get it registered in court so it's fine you can you know do it and does that answer Aaron or do you have any other question yeah okay so yeah I just want to repeat that um, you know Paul is not against 
uh, using the justice system. You know, the justice system is a system of the land. Um, yes, we see that it's corrupt and and so on, but uh, you know that is not the original intent. You know, the, it, the original intent is to dispense justice, right? Um, so that people uh, are not wronged and uh, you know justice is served. That is the reason you have courts and so on. So Paul is not against that, but Paul is really uh, his emphasis and his thing is you know, why are believers going and why are believers cheating one another and trying to you know uh, uh, do wrong to one another uh, and uh, and doing this uh, by filing court cases one with another and you're doing this in a court of law. Right. The whole world is watching. The name of the Lord is being is not really honored, and you yourselves are, you know, bringing um, uh, a dishonor, you know, to the church and to yourselves. And don't you know this is your position in Christ? You know that you want you will actually one day rule over cities, rule over angels, and so on, judge between angels and so on. So, um, so why are you doing this? Right. Okay. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Okay. Okay, fine. Then what we'll do is we'll uh, yeah we'll we'll take a break. Now it's almost time, so we'll take a break and then we'll we'll come back to chapter seven. Okay. Right.